I V M. to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories, India's very own travel podcast, where each week we share the journey of travellers in their own words and relive their experiences with you, our listeners. Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories and in a brand new year, here's wishing all our listeners a very happy and healthy 2020. Before we get on with today's episode, a couple of quick announcements. Firstly, a big shout out to Akash and Anish for their lovely feedback. Thank you so much, guys. It's much appreciated. Second, we are very happy to announce the winner of our book giveaway, Rahul Chittiprolu. Congratulations, Rahul. You will hear from us shortly and a copy of Ajay Kamal Akaran's Globetrotting for Love and Other Love Stories from Sarklin will be in your mail very soon. As for today's episode... We take you on a safari with a very, very special guest. Let's jump onto the episode and find out more. So with that introduction, I'd love to welcome Suyash Keshri, a very young wildlife filmmaker and presenter, I should say, to the Musafir Stories. Hi, Suyash. Welcome to the Musafir Stories. Hello, Suyash. Hi, Seth. Hi, Feza. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It's our pleasure that we have such a young achiever. You've done so much. <laughs> and it actually gives us uh, like life goals, a I little know. bit of <laughs> life goals. Uh, we'll, we'll speak more. Uh, I don't want to give it away all at the beginning. Uh, we'll speak more to it. But Suyash, before we get into the specifics, um, why don't you tell us and the listeners a little bit more about you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'm born and brought up in central India. Uh, I was born in Madhya Pradesh. Then I lived in Chhattisgarh. Uh, just because of my dad's background, we've been able to uh, live in different places. I say to people that I have, um, you know, 10 houses, 10 homes, um, but not my house, it's just 10 homes because I don't feel at home at only just one place. They're just different places. Uh, then after living in central India for about 10 years, uh, I came to New Delhi. I lived here for nine years. Then I moved to United States for my education. Um, I went to Wake Forest University in North Carolina and then I worked in Washington, D.C. as a political advocacy guy. But recently, I left that job in May and um, moved back to India to follow my childhood dream to become a wildlife presenter and filmmaker full time. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the ride, we should say. And uh, yeah. all of this for uh, all of 23? Yeah, I'm said? just 23. <laughs> <laughs> so starting off, Soyash, uh, how did your interest in wildlife start off? You know, it's an interesting story that's happened at a very young age. Uh, I was just about four years old. Uh, my Nana Ji, uh, unfortunately, he died a couple of years ago, but uh, my Nana Ji used to take me to the Kolkata Zoo. And um, mm-hmm. he had already introduced me to wildlife TV shows on Animal Planet, National Geographic, Discovery. So at a very young age, instead of watching uh, Tom trying to catch Jerry, uh, I was I was watching hyenas uh, devouring a live animal, lions fighting with each other. Um, looking back, that's a quite devil-like passion I had uh, because I would be thrilled at the sight of guts spilling everywhere. <laughs> but but I think it it set me on a path towards just like loving wildlife. And this one time, I was standing next to a tiger cage in Kolkata Zoo. Um, and the tigress just snarled at me and just like every other person there and every other kid, I jumped up in excitement and started clapping my hands. And that's when my Nanaji came to me and he said, um, beta, uh, which basically means son for the English viewers, beta, tumhe in animals ko dekkar maza aata hai, which essentially means, do you like seeing animals in these cages? And I said, yes, absolutely. I love it. And that's when he said something very important to me, which... I never knew it would change the course of my life so so much. He said, you know, these animals are not the same animals you see in Discovery or National Geographic. These animals are going to be in their cage, in the 4 by 4 cage for the rest of their lives. Mm. So I guess that broke my heart at a very young age and um, brought out some very honest truths about it. 
and set me on a path to just learning more about wildlife, uh, being more passionate about it, exploring about it, and just imagining myself in a place where I could do something uh, to protect them, to tell their stories, and just to enjoy the beautiful natural world that we have, uh, especially here in India. Yeah, so that's just a little bit of background how the wildlife interest came through. Uh, I also, as I said, grew up in central India, so uh, wildlife was practically in the backyard all the time. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We'll definitely talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but also tell me a little bit more about, um, I know you spoke a little bit about your um, how the interest in wildlife um, arose, but mm-hmm. through your um, short career so far, right? Uh, uh, like how did all of this happen in terms of uh, you being abroad and uh, I mean, in, in one way you had like a cushy job, right? A lot of us yeah. kind of crave for that. Uh, but at this, I wouldn't even say ripe age. Uh, I mean, uh, you're literally looking, the, the whole world is up to you. At this point, you have uh, left that behind and made a decision to um, kind of uh, like completely change gears and... Um, choose a different career path. Yeah, yeah, choose an alternative career path, not even um, say you're coming back to India just to pick up something, um, say another cushy and better better paying job or anything, right? You've uh, chosen to follow your passion. So uh, how did how did that big of a decision, how, how did you make it this, this young age and how did that come about? Yeah, so, you know, a little bit of background, like I, I always wanted to do something like this, but somewhere along the way, the uh, the drive to make this a career was uh, mounted by the needs and the financial needs, the the societal needs of you know this. Yeah, this is not so called the standard path uh, towards success, especially in in the Indian society where people right. usually go towards becoming an engineer, doctor. Uh, mm-hmm. lawyer, uh, which is there's nothing wrong with that. But that's just not what I was interested in. And in as I went to college, uh, I decided, look, I, I still want to do this. So I'm going to find a way uh, to continue wildlife photography, find a way to become a filmmaker. And about my sophomore year, which is second year, mm-hmm. I had a chance to intern with a wildlife filmmaker, renowned wildlife filmmaker in India. But even though he signed me up for the internship, uh, he was not willing to pay me. He was not willing to even cover my travel costs or my meals. Um, and when I came back to, and this was all set up, but when I came back to India from US after finishing my second year, this guy said to me, he's like, oh, uh, you know, why don't you go to Tarova National Park, which is a big national park in India, um, film for us. And then get back the film and we might not be able to even give you the credits. Uh, we can't hold any of your uh, reservations or we can't pay for anything. So that was like, that's weird. Why is he telling me to do that? Um, of course, then I decided not to do that. Then I tried another uh, nature magazine um, trying to do something for them. And they were like, yeah, let's do it. I said, let's do a project in Chhattisgarh. And they said, yes, absolutely, let's do it. We look for the young talent and stuff. So the minute I booked my tickets, uh, a couple weeks later, when the day came to actually go to Chhattisgarh, they said, sorry, we've decided to go up, go with our senior associate uh, who's helping us in Chhattisgarh. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, those two and a couple other uh, instances really brought me down. Um, it was like, well, maybe maybe people are right. There's no... There's no um, place in this field or there's no future in this field. And a lot of people in this profession itself, people who are award-winning photographers and filmmakers, they said, yeah, man, there's no future in this field. You're young right now. Don't make a mistake like us following this field. There's no financial benefit. There's no um, other benefit. And that kind of like, as a, I mean, come on, as an 18 or 19 year old, that influenced me so much that I actually gave up that dream. Um, I went towards my second passion, which was politics. Uh, then I, you know, I studied politics and international affairs. I worked in the U.S. Congress. Uh, I worked as a kind of a lobbyist, uh, more like a political advocacy job in Washington, D.C. But mm-hmm. somehow, so- somewhere deep inside, it was killing me that I did not give my full go at my passion. I listened to other people. I listened to people who don't know me. I didn't listen to myself. 
So I decided, look, I'm never going to be 23 in my life. Never am I ever going to have such a uh, time to take a risk. Um, I have no responsibilities financially. I don't have wife and kids. Maybe 28, 30, who knows? Maybe I have someone. So that's when I decided, look, I'm going to leave my job. I'm going to have to move back to India, give up everything, say goodbye to my dog, my friends in the U.S., um, sell my car, sell my apartment and take this risk. Um, and if I fail, well, I fail. At least I gave it all. So, yeah, I moved back to India. And the idea was to just do it yourself. Uh, don't rely on anybody because people will bring you down for some other other reason or at the end of the day it might not work out with someone because they truly don't know your passion so the idea was to make a wildlife series um and post it on my own youtube channel and depending on its success reach out to someone like wwf national geographic or discovery for a season two Mm -hmm. Uh, It just happened so that WWF and International had already reached out to me for my tiger photos. And they specifically liked my writing. So they asked me to donate uh, donate some photos um, earlier this year, maybe around February, I think. And I donated about 200 photos. So we were in touch. And then I was inducted into the WWF Voices program this summer. Uh, because of my work with Tiger, which is basically the Young Ambassadors or Young Content Creators program. And I led the Global Tiger Day, uh, the social social media campaign for Global Tiger Day, uh, which was very successful. We reached about uh, 200,000 people uh, just with that Global Tiger Day campaign, which was amazing. Mm. And I told them, look, I'm working on a series and I would like some of your, you know, advice, expert advice on that and that of your team. And I sent them first two episodes and they really liked it. And that's when the idea came. Why don't I pitch it to WWF? So by end of August, I got uh, five episodes ready. I sent sent them all the first cut and they liked it a lot. So we decided to do it together and launch the series together. So yeah, from that, uh, long story short, um, (laughs) <laughs> leaving a corporate job uh, or a political job to become a full-time presenter. I'm still trying to figure it out for sure, but that's that's a little bit into it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's wonderful. And really hats off to you because at such a young age, you've taken that decision. Uh, because of, of all these years, right, I've realized one thing that before we step or start doing anything we it, we pretty much end up hearing what other people say and yeah. we are uh, ha- yeah we are halfway like toned down by w- other people's failures and we don't give our like we don't give it a shot from our end but hats off to you that you you understood that at such a young age and you went ahead and gave your best and tried and congratulations to all the success also that yeah, you got exactly. with it yeah. <laughs> because uh, yeah. i think Thank to some you. level I should say it's despite of, um, right, because uh, I think it's a little bit of a cultural thing as well, especially yeah. uh, kids growing up in India, they have this peer pressure to follow the conventional path, right? Uh, we have yeah, that. absolutely. So, Suyash, uh, why don't you give us a little bit of a brief backdrop about um, the series on YouTube that uh, you're currently uh, presenting uh, you you are the filmmaker and the presenter for the series called as a safari with suyash which uh, also yeah. <laughs> i think the <laughs> little connection we have is that uh, safari and musafir they have the same root word which is suffer uh, which basically yeah, means traveling <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you tell us and the listeners a little bit more about uh, safari with suyash um, where people can check it out and what it is about uh, give a brief um, i think intro to it and then we can talk a little bit more about the specifics yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Safari with Suyash uh, is it is at its season one. Uh, we do have a season two as well. That's why I try telling people it's just at season one. Uh, it's essentially a virtual safari experience where people get to go on a safari uh, with me to one of the most exciting places in India. It's called Bandhavgarh National Park. It's, mm-hmm. it's essentially now the tiger capital of the world because of its high density of tigers and just the historical significance of that region. Uh, it was mm-hmm. actually a a hunting grounds for the Maharaja of Riva. And um, even going beyond that, uh, like earlier history, it was actually in, in Hindu mythology supposed to be a gift by Lord Ram to his brother Lakshman. Uh, that's yeah. why the name Bandav Gar comes from. Bandav meaning brother and Gar meaning fort, uh, because yeah. there's an ancient fort on top of the on top of the plateau, uh, which is known as Bandav Gar. 
But yeah, it's with WWF International. Uh, it, you can watch it on WWF International's uh, YouTube channel or simply type Safari with Suyash on YouTube and it should show up, hopefully. Um, <laughs> and it's a five-part series. It's basically a succession. It's short format. Uh, I believe that uh, people don't have 45 minutes or 15 minutes of their day or even 30 minutes of their day to spare uh, on something that they might not be interested in. This series was not made for just wildlife lovers, like a lot of the current web series are made. Uh, they mm-hmm. target a specific audience who already watches this kind of series. Uh, but this is made for everyone. This is made for people who might not be interested in wildlife, but but for them to watch it and then go like, oh my God, that is amazing. I want to see more. That's the whole idea of it because we believe that you can only change people's attitudes uh, by making them fall in love with it and also keeping it short and concise. So most episodes are between five and uh, nine minutes long and Mm -hmm. it's based around a story of a tigress named Solo. Uh, Solo is a tigress uh, who I've known since she was about four months old. I've been very lucky to know several individuals in Bandhavgarh because I've been traveling there for about uh, 10, 11 years now. And I knew Solo's mother. Uh, Unfortunately, she passed away a couple of years ago, but her legacy lives on through her cubs like Solo. And Solo now has four little cubs. And the reason we decided to make it around cubs is because I feel like as a filmmaker and storyteller, it's easy for me to grip the audience by showing uh, some cute activity or also the future Uh, of this species uh, because these cubs four of them are going to be future of this troubled species so Mm -hmm. the the story is centered around them about tracking them but you know you don't start off the series by seeing tigers at all Uh, you start off by actually being on a safari Um, so you try tracking tigers you 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 see how the temperature is really drastic uh, it's 48 degrees sometimes you wake up early in the morning so it's really trying to get people involved in a safari involved in a virtual experience and try transporting them from all across the world to a remote location uh, such as Bandhavgarh National Park okay okay brilliant good luck and, and yeah I'll, I'll just reiterate that uh, the series is called Safari with Suyash we will definitely mm-hmm. include links to the series and individual episodes as well in the show notes Thank section you. of the podcast. And uh, to make it easier for the listeners, we'll also go ahead and uh, name this episode uh, of the podcast as a Safari with Suyash. So you don't even have to hey. go look. <laughs> you don't even have to go looking in the show notes to um, find the name. You can definitely uh, find the links there. But yeah, it's as easy as just going and uh, typing Safari with Suyash on YouTube, and you will have. Um, all of those, all of those uh, episodes just listed out as a playlist, um, and and as uh, Suyash also called out, it's um, it makes it very easy, right? Uh, like you said, making the episodes or keeping the episodes short, um, it it kind of arouses that curiosity for people to go out and uh, like look or read or think a little bit more about this because yeah. uh, it also comes down a lot to uh, the stories behind a lot of the things or the animals or even the people that you kind of try and uh, touch upon in these uh, in the series right it's it's all Absolutely. about those stories and uh, uh, Suyash also has a brilliant website that he um, has that kind of stores a lot more of his work his portfolio as well as uh, the stories and uh, uh, the different awards that Suyash has won so we link <laughs> that too thank you and uh, also going back to the, the location of the national park that you've chosen to cover the series right Bandhavgad like you said a very um, historic and a very significant um, piece of the uh, wildlife in India also right it's I think uh, one of the most densely populated tiger population that yeah, you find absolutely. in uh, national parks right so that way also I think um, it's it's great and like you mentioned there's a mythological um backstory to this as well as well as uh absolutely the, uh, the the national park i mean it wasn't a national park uh, back then as such but right from the days of the kings this used to be more like a game reserve right this is where the, yeah more like a hunting reserve exactly so um that too so it has that bit of connection too um now how has your experience been um like uh, just draw out uh for us and our listeners uh the whole process, right? Uh, as a, I mean, when you go out to a safari, it's more uh, like um, 
sitting in a jeep or following the, mm-hmm. uh, uh, I guess the guide or whoever the uh, naturalist is on on board and uh, trying to follow his directions. But uh, when how was your experience when you like set out to film this um, film the series right? Uh, um, how was that different and uh, uh, like what does the whole process of uh, tracking uh, a tiger because uh, the, the series focuses on tiger right mo, mo, yeah. I mean, the primary focus is on tiger so how is the whole thing given that this is in the plains with the quite drastic temperatures also right so uh, yes, absolutely. just share that experience with us please sure so I guess like uh, just for your viewers if you're planning to go on a safari in India a couple things to keep in mind number one uh, I feel like some wildlife and nature documentaries um, have put up a very false sense of, or ra- rather elevated sense of game viewing, uh, mm-hmm. which, because since, you know, if it's a 45 minute documentary about wildlife, of course, for the 45 minutes, you're going to be seeing wildlife. But when you go on a safari, that's not going to be the case. Most of the mm-hmm. times so you're going to see only trees, plants, shrubs, which you should appreciate. Uh, but wildlife in India is, uh, is uh, although the density is high, it's difficult to find because the forest is very thick. Uh, tigers, leopards, especially all the big cats are very difficult. So it's important to note that uh, when you go on a safari, uh, one day you might get lucky and see everything. Uh, the other day, you don't. You might not get lucky and see nothing. Uh, myself, I've spent four or five days uh, without even taking a single photograph, without even t- recording a single second of footage because there's nothing to see. Uh, that's on the one side, but on the second side... Wildlife safaris in India are pretty expensive. The government puts up a lot of conservation fees and just the industry as a whole since there are only limited passes. For example, in a place like Bandhavgarh National Park, you can only buy, uh, I think there are 75 vehicles allowed at one point. So the tickets get sold like two or three months in advance. So any of the listeners planning to visit Bandhavgarh National Park or any other national park in India, I think they should do do their due diligence before because it, it's such a high demand place. People from all across the world come uh, to a place like that. And once you're in the safari itself, you basically, uh, unless you're trained yourself, uh, you basically rely on your guide and your naturalist uh, to do the tracking. Uh, mostly for the tigers, you look for alarm calls of deer, langur, sambar. Uh, you also look for pug marks. You also look for or, or hear out the calls and roars of tigers or different animals um, pointing towards a tiger's location. But it's, it's, it's almost that, you know, tigers, uh, it's their forest. <laughs> so a tiger might be here uh, on one day and might be 50 kilometers away the next day because they cover a large amount of ground every single day just to mark their territories. Uh, if, the, if a tigress has cubs, she tries moving the cubs every now and then. Uh, if a male is uh, marking his territory, he makes sure that he uh, uh, makes a clear scent marking and lets his rivals know that it's his territory. So there's a lot about understanding the ecology and a lot about understanding the behavior of animals uh, when you go, uh, I think what my experience has been with of uh, a lot of people who don't know about safaris is they expect an African safari in India. But, they, <laughs> but, but the thing in Africa is, yes, there are animals. In India also there are animals. But in Africa, the, the visibility is really high. You could see mm-hmm. for kilometers and kilometers because it's all grassland. In mm. India, that's not the case. If a tiger is five meters from you, hidden in the bush, you won't be able to see it. Uh, so that, there's definitely a difference between an Indian safari and African safari. Uh, there are a lot of good differences, a lot of bad differences as well. But I think, you know, as as you, your podcast says, you, you're always a musafir. You're always roaming around. Uh, <laughs> so just as that, um, you, you just enjoy nature, listen to the sounds of the forest, Breathe in the fresh oxygen, uh, especially if you're like me and, and living in a place like Delhi, where mm. the air quality <laughs> index is constantly at hazardous. Um, that is a much needed respite. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Swayash, is there any incident or um, like a small animal story that you came across that left an impact on you? Yeah, uh, there have been a lot of them, but I think, you know, there's been one specific story that 
completely changed uh, my perspective on wildlife and also f- almost like enraged me to follow this passion wholeheartedly. And it's a story from Bandhavgarh National Park. And that's kind of the reason why I decided to make a documentary series uh, on Bandhavgarh. On the one side, I've been going there for 12, uh, 11, 12 years. And I know the locals really well. It has a special place in my heart. But on the other side of my lives, I feel like I've been interwoven with the lives of the tigers. Uh, just a couple of years ago, I photographed this tigress uh, who is the daughter of a tigress who was named as Suki Patiha. Uh, mm-hmm. Suki Patiha died uh, due to poisoning earlier this year, um, oh. which is incredibly sad. But at that time, I photographed her daughter, uh, who was about six months old. Mm-hmm. And she came really, really close to my vehicle. And she was just looking at us curiously. And I looked at her eyes. Um, and it was it was almost as if I could feel the connection and the curiosity. I actually won an award for that image. Um, it was called the Nature's Best Photography Asia Award. And the mm-hmm. photograph was in the Smithsonian Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C. for a year. Oh my uh, god, wow. The sad <laughs> Yeah, that's the good part about it, but the sad part about it is is the story. Um mm-hmm. that tigress was six months old and just a couple months after I took that photograph, uh she disappeared and oh. she was never found. Um so it's most likely a poaching incident. Uh, mm-hmm. especially with cubs at that age, uh it's very easy for poachers to even capture the cubs. Um, for God knows whatever reason, you know, either in the petting industry, either in the traditional medicine industry in the Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. It's sad that her mother also uh, had a similar fate where a, a carcass was poisoned and, and, and she was killed. So I think those two, the, that story uh, really impacted me. And I said, um, if a place like Bandhavgarh National Park, which is world renowned for his tigers, where security is at its highest. If people can still come in and poach a tiger, then this story is yet to be told. This story is more significant and more important now than ever. Absolutely. And I think th- th- that bit that you called out, right, uh, it is it is necessary to bring out these stories and uh, create awareness about it. Because yeah. uh, even as of today, even though we see that um, the tiger populations are slowly back on the rise, uh, I believe we mm-hmm. have um, close to about 3,000 tigers in India now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2,967, yeah. Exactly. And they've been growing over the past uh, decade or so, but... Uh, Still, if you look back in relative terms, I think uh, about 90 or 95 uh, percent of the tiger population from the beginning of the 20th century or whatever has been wiped out, right? By yeah, absolutely. Um, basically, the man-animal <laughs> conflict <laughs> and uh, yeah, things like poaching. So, what are some of the big challenges that uh, more than challenges, threats? to um, wildlife that exists, Suyash? Yeah, so the number one uh, historical threat has been just traditional medicine. Uh, Places in China, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, North Mm -hmm. Korea, South Korea, uh, tiger bones are, and even tiger meat is Mm -hmm. very prized. So it's a luxury and uh, it's falsely believed that tiger bone wine, tiger bone soup, can cure cancer, can make you live for 120 years old, and uh, can cure, it's also used as an aphrodisiac, it can cure erectile dysfunction. It's all false beliefs. Uh, It's purely not scientific. Uh, There's no scientific evidence for that. So it's an absolute luxury. Uh, Of course, then there's the skin trade, there's the claw and meat uh, trade, uh, did you know a uh, one one bowl of tiger bone soup in 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 China in a good nice restaurant in China can cost four hundred dollars. Oh my god! That's how much expensive it is. So pound for pound, pound for pound, tiger bones are more expensive than any other mineral on this earth. Wow! And it, and this is exactly why the tigers are so so prized possession for the poachers um Mm -hmm. but the sad reality is you see a lot of the locals in india they're so poor if if someone came to you uh, or if someone came to a farmer rather and they said look the crops have failed this year because there's no rain uh you don't have money you have four kids none of them go to school none of them even have food on their plate they can hardly get one square meal 
let me give you 6,000 rupees, which is just about a $100. Uh, let me give you 6,000 rupees. Go and kill a tiger for me. And the farmer would absolutely do that. Anyone yeah. in that that place would do that because it's out of necessity for the family. The farmer doesn't care that, that the tiger population is declining. The farmer cares about his family, which he should. And while the farmer gets about 6,000, 7,000, 10,000 maybe, the middleman is the person who makes a lot of money. Uh, mm -hmm. an, an entire tiger, depending on the size and weight, can fetch between $200,000 and $800,000. Oh so God. it's big money. It's big money. So yeah, that's on one side, just the demand. And the second side is really we're encroaching on their lands. I mean, India itself loses some 333 acres of forest every single day, uh, mm -hmm. which is horrible. And... People are saying we need more tigers. We need to double tiger numbers. Um, as a tiger lover, I, I would love that. But at the same time, like, where are these tigers going to go? There's no yeah. space left for them. We're taking all over their territories. We're, we're expanding and developing in a very unsustainable rate. So where are these tigers going to go? Uh, so those are a few problems. Um, of course, climate change now is having an impact on tigers like never before. So mm -hmm. this is there's a new study which shows basically tiger territories which were supposed to be uh, you know females cover between fifteen and forty square kilometers males cover about one hundred and fifty even two hundred square kilometers tiger territories in many national parks are increasing because tigers are having to go further and further just to find water um, because it's too hot in the summers and everything just dries up. So, yeah, those are a few instances that are just completely changing the tiger population and diminishing them. And also everything below that, because if the tiger goes, uh, there's literally nothing in that environment that can survive. Uh, because over time, due to overgrazing and just the uh, entire chain being broken um, and the incentive to conserve any forest is because that the tiger lives in those forests. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's uh, great that uh, you are uh, touching upon some of the like little intricacies and the delicate balance, right, between man and tiger absolutely. that exists, that uh, you are touching upon that in the series too, because uh, what is the need of the art is awareness, not, not just uh, to the... I think uh, audiences, say the city dwelling audiences, but also to the locals who live in and around uh, the, the where the tigers live or the uh, or the national parks. So I think it's great that you're doing that. Um, I think uh, as as we uh, inch closer, I'd like to throw back the focus a little bit more about the series itself. Right, uh, you did call out uh, initially that uh, you are focusing uh, in this particular series, uh, the first season one of uh, Safari with Soyash on um, this tigress called Solo. Is, is that uh, what her name is? Yeah, and her cubs. Um, because um, uh, I think even historically, Bandhavgarh has had some uh, pretty famous, pretty popular uh, inhabitants, right? Going back to Charger and Sita and uh, yeah. Rajbera. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that way also, I think it's great that you're kind of carrying on that legacy in one way. By uh, because it is Rajbera's uh, one of Rajbera's uh, cubs is what uh, Solo, as you said, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if, if for anyone interested, uh, after you've watched um, Suyash's uh, series on YouTube, you can also go check out. Uh, I think it was called Dynasties, right? The series. Yeah, so Dynasties was about Rajbera and Solo, actually made by BBC. Uh, exactly. So I think Suyash is doing a great job in kind of carrying that legacy forward now <laughs> with uh, Solo and her kids, her cubs. It's just these little things. So that that's what I like about uh, these stories related to the national parks and uh, the tigers, right? It's, it's not mm -hmm. just about going and seeing the big cat. It's also understanding a little bit more about uh, what those uh, legacies have been, who the famous um, like inhabitants of these national parks have been. For example, Charger was, I think, um, he's, he's uh, apparently one of the uh, most photographed tigers also in the world, like when he was around, right? Yeah, um, and absolutely. Uh, but what, what plans, like, what does... Um, Say, uh, can you give us a little bit of a, a brief insight into what next after season one? Yeah, so after season one, I'm actually traveling uh, to Bandhagar National Park uh, for 25 days. I'm mm -hmm. uh, taking uh, different people from across the world 
on a real safari with Suyash. Um, they're some from France, Germany, UK, uh, Singapore. And the goal essentially was to, you know, okay, now you've seen the series. Now you can come travel and explore this place, explore India for what it really is and find ways to get involved in these uh, conservation activities. So mm -hmm. during the time when we'll be there, uh, of course, they're going to be going on safaris, learning about wildlife, and as, as a result, getting closer to wildlife and nature. Uh, but they're also going to be meeting locals. And for someone from a Western country to come to India, meet a local and really understand what the issues are and how how people in India live survive and live sometimes often in harmony with with wildlife often not uh, I think that's going to be critical so the what has been the essence of my uh, drive is if I can change attitudes and minds towards wildlife and the locals one at a time then I'm successful um, some people are like, yeah, dude, if you're going to post on YouTube, it might, it might not reach millions of people or, Hey, your Instagram, it's not reaching a million people. So you're not being successful. I think success lies at changing attitudes one at a time. Um, that mass audience, maybe one day I'll reach there, but for now, I'm really happy with just changing one at a time. Uh, and then after that season two, um, we're planning to launch. Uh, early 2020 uh, it's already been filmed uh, it's already been filmed and presented in South Africa mm -hmm. uh, so yeah those are the plans so far um, I don't have anything else planned until then because uh, it's going to be so much work uh, just to get all the season two post-production done because I'm a one-man team uh, I mm -hmm. don't have a big team supporting me or anything like that so I'm a one-man team one-man show just trying to make it work <laughs> And yeah, let's hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All our good wishes to you, Suyash. It's great that Thank you've you. been doing this. And uh, yeah, reminds me of uh, the movie Three Idiots. Uh, I don't know if you've watched that, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Farhan, Everyone right? Says that. Oh my God. <laughs> Everyone says that. It's so funny. <laughs> So yeah, like uh, like you said, right? Uh, the goal should be to uh, reach a mass audience. But b before that, when you're starting out, you have to look at um, doing it like one person or one attitude at a time. And yeah, but the mass happens yeah. through one person at a time exactly. as well. Yeah, right. And Word of mouth. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I think of all the people, you have at least two of us there for you, <laughs> <laughs> and trying our yeah, trying our best to spread the word around that how important it is to consider and to spread awareness about wildlife conservation. So yeah, hats off to you, Soyash, and good luck. I hope all things fall into place, and Thank I you. hope even with yeah, I hope even with your series, it goes really well. It's yeah. already doing brilliant. I just hope it reaches more Thank heights. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, and uh, we, we'd also like to give this opportunity one more time so us to just call out uh, where people can watch the series as well as how people can follow your work. Yeah, absolutely. So people can watch it on YouTube. Uh, uh, just simply type WWF International and Safari with Suyash will be one of the playlists. Uh, you can also just say Safari with Suyash on YouTube and it should show up. Uh, you can also follow my work on Instagram uh, and Facebook. Uh, just type my name, Suyash Keshri. Uh, you can go onto my website for additional information as well, which is uh, suyashkeshri.com. Um, and I guess like before we wrap up, uh, thank you so much, Seth and Feza, for having me here. Uh, and I also want to reiterate how important uh, just ecotourism and nature tourism is. Uh, since this is a travel podcast, I encourage all your listeners uh, to go out and seek their little sanctuary, um, be it uh, anywhere in the world. You know, your your most your closest park can be hiding a lot of secrets that you might not know about it um, and just explore nature and find ways to connect with it. And that's how we can start preserving more and more. Uh, as I said on my trailer, what we can see, we can love. And what we can love, we will fight to protect. Yeah, Absolutely. I think yeah. <laughs> with those golden words, uh, we're really, really uh, happy and thankful that uh, we had this opportunity to have you on the podcast, Suyash. And uh, like you said, the Cubs, right, they represent the future of uh, the, yeah. the 
legacy of the tigers and the wildlife and in a similar way i think you a young wildlife photographer a young wildlife filmmaker also uh, kind of shows us a great future ahead um, not just in terms of uh, the great work you're doing but also uh, just the way you're following your passion and uh, literally charting out your own uh, route your own path right not sticking to those uh, tried and tested conventional paths so really really happy to talk to you and we wish you all the best in all your future endeavors and we look forward to the beautiful work that you're putting out too good luck suyash thank you suyash thank you so much guys it's been a pleasure and best of luck to you guys as well That was yet another great episode of The Bizarre Stories. If you guys like the show, please subscribe to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, Audio Boom, Savan, Pocket Casts, Castbox, Stitcher, or any other podcasting app available on iOS or Android. Please do leave us a review on iTunes. It goes a long way in the show's discoverability. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We go by the handle The Bizarre Stories. Or, if it suits you, you could email us at themosafirstories at gmail.com or visit our website at www.themosafirstories.com for more information. All of these links will be made available in the show notes section of each episode. So here's to more traveling, sharing and inspiring. Stay tuned for our next episode. Until then, happy travels and goodbye. Goodbye.